All right, folks, if we could have uh, everybody grab their seats, we're going to get started. Um, this, this is going to be an exciting one. Um, again, I want to extend a thank you to all of our speakers, um, especially Uma. That was a really hot start to the day. Um, uh, I'm, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker coming from Netflix, um, Nabil Shear. Nabil? Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm gonna fiddle with things here, sorry. So my name is Nabil Shear. Uh, I've been at Netflix for a little under three years. And uh, there I'm a security engineer, and I do work with our teams that build the platform on which the rest of Netflix operates, and I help them do security. And more recently, I've been doing more like risk reduction, access control assessment, and stuff like that. Um, and so what I want to tell you about today is like, how can you deploy OS Query to get some visibility where you didn't have it in your cloud environment and, and literally do as little work as you possibly can to, en to enable that? And um, the reason for that is that you know, it wasn't really entirely my job to do this. Uh, one of the problems that we had at Netflix is that it wasn't really anybody's job to do this. And so uh, in the Netflix culture, we have this notion of what we call bias to action which sort of sounds like do what you want. And so I took that, to, took that seriously and I decided to try and uh, make this work uh, for Netflix so we could start to answer some questions. And I wanna give you some insights into how we did this. And the reason, like I said, that it's on the cheap is that we really, or you know, my motivation for doing this was to try and make this work without really putting a lot of effort into it and furthermore, uh, to not pay attention to it operationally on a day-to-day -day basis and just have it do its thing. So that's what you're gonna hear about today. Uh, I'll give you some of the lessons learned that we had from that, that experience, uh, some of the kind of choices that we made and how we rolled our, our OS query infrastructure out. Uh, in some cases, those choices have come back to bite us. I'll tell you about that. Uh, in other cases, they actually turned out to work out pretty well. So uh, without further ado, let, let's get started. So before I jump into all the OS querying, I need to tell you a little bit about Netflix because some people don't quite have the right idea. So, how does Netflix work? Right, so you go sit down after a long day of listening to people like me drone on and on and on about OS query and you're like, let me watch, let me Netflix and chill. So you sit down, you know, you fire up your TV or you got your iPad or whatever, and you find a title you wanna watch and you click play. What's gonna happen when you click play is your client device is gonna reach out to a bunch of different microservices that exist uh, in our cloud environment that's hosted in AWS in one of a handful of regions. It's gonna do some various things to figure out where to route you, and then it's gonna send you to our content distribution network, which is called OpenConnect, uh, which is deployed all around the world. Uh, really cool stuff. Uh, all that stuff about the content distribution network, I'm not gonna talk about at all. What I'm talking about is our AWS cloud environment. So once it gets, it gets you steered to your uh, CDN appliance, it's gonna start slamming bits of, of um, Stranger Things or whatever it is that you chose to watch uh, at your device, and you're gonna be happy. Uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, Netflix has evolved quite a bit over the 25 years that we've been in existence. You know, we used to be a DVD shipping company, uh, then we turned into a streaming company, and then we turned into one of the largest movie and TV production studios in the world. So there's a whole bunch of services that also run in our AWS cloud environment that support our studio. Uh, we also have a giant pile of big data processing that we use for personalization, for predictions, uh, for you name it, there's a, a bunch of that going on. And then finally, you know, we're a big business with you know, tens of thousands of employees, hundreds of thousands of different partners. You know, think of all the people, the person who holds the, the boom mic you know, for, for on the set of Bridgerton, they have a user account somewhere in our systems. So we have, um, tons and tons of services that also support the business. And don't even get me started on, we have games now. I'm gonna do a little advertising pitch here. They're actually quite cool, they're good, I like games. The Netflix games are good. Play some knittens, it's, it's, it's addictive. Uh, and, and more are coming. And then we also, more recently, if you've been following the news, are gonna start to be an advertising business. Uh, and that's you know, a big shift for Netflix, and it's gonna result, from my perspective, as somebody who cares about our infrastructure security, and just like a whole lot more microservices doing a whole lot more things uh, and uh, that we need to keep track of. So we have this problem. Uh, I'll tell you, we have about 7,000 different microservices that are deployed in our AWS environment. Uh, when we break this down by EC2 instances and the and containers that run on our container platform, which is called Titus, uh, there's around about two and a half to three million different workloads that we have in our cloud uh, every day. 
And so you might be thinking, well, you know, maybe that's cool. Netflix was early to this cloud thing. We really pioneer an immutable infrastructure, right? We deploy things using our deployment system called Spinnaker, uh, and things that exist within what we call the streaming path, namely this thing that gets Stranger Things to you, uh, those things deploy pretty regularly and pretty frequently. But it's not always as immutable as you might think. Some of those studio applications are getting modified in place. Some of our databases can't be re redeployed as frequently as we would like. And our container hosting platform does all manner of things, from batch jobs to hosting microservices to doing machine learning, you name it. And so what we needed is we needed a way to understand what was going on in our running cloud fleet. And we, that, we think that that's important for security. I'm a security person, so I care about security visibility. I need to know what's going on before I can secure it. And we also need this for like fleet management needs. So we had a bunch of different data sources that could help us with this, but none of them were really designed for security use cases. And furthermore, this is the one that's a little more um, hard to swallow, is that nobody was really looking at it very much. Like we had some data sources, but they were incomplete and they weren't worth looking at. So when I came to this problem, I was like, all right, let's come up with what are the constraints? How do we actually get this done in our environment? And we basically came up with four sort of criteria that we want to accomplish with our, our instance monitoring approach. The first is actionability, and this is really near and dear to my heart. I do not like collecting piles of data that are piles of data. Uh, and so I would much rather collect things that I can a use actionably to reduce risk. So for example, collecting data that, that helps me to directly reduce risk, for example, by discovering vulnerable packages deployed in our systems. Or collecting data that can be used for very extremely low noise detections that have high signal to noise ratio, right? Like things that if they fire, definitely a bad thing is gone. And then the distant third goal of collecting all this data is for forensic purposes. Another big constraint that we have is performance, right? We have a bunch of different uh, microservices, like I said. Each of those microservices is the baby of some team at Netflix, right? And so if we come in there and take a bunch of their CPU away, or if we come in there and add a 5 to 10% CPU overhead to some of our larger microservices, that can literally cost millions of dollars, and that will make people upset. So we, we basically had the, the criteria, the goal here of like, the application owners must not notice. Right, this must exist almost invisibly, so we have to be very careful about what we collect. Um, we have a lot of stuff. Like I said, two and a half million workloads, large, very, very large AWS deployment. Uh, even tiny costs add up in terms of data transfer, data storage, you name it. And then finally, as a security person, you know, when everyone these, run these like OS monitoring things, they always have to run as root, because of course they have to run as root, because they need to collect data that only root can have. Um, and then you know, we wire that up to a control plane, and now we have a botnet. Right, so what we wanted to do is to avoid actually introducing a whole lot more attack surface. We need really consistent, predictable behavior for our applications, or like I said, those 7,000 app owners whose babies we were messing with, not gonna be happy with us. So we took a look at what we had already. So we had some capabilities to ingest some of the syslogs from our, our environment. Um, that had kind of medium to low actionability, Performance, scale, and attack surface were good because there's no control plane. This is just statically baked in. It costs very little. It moves very little data. We have a bunch of really cool performance management tools. Uh, you may have heard of Flame Graphs. We have a tool that actually deploys out and will do performance uh, profiling and assessment against services. Really cool stuff. Uh, but the actionability for security purposes of these tools was low, and also uh, we actually can't run them across our whole fleet or it would all keel over and die. We have to select single instances out of, out of a, a scaling group and assess that one to try and figure out what's going on performance-wise. Uh, we also have an unnamed third-party agent that we run in our environments that are under compliance. So you know, we process hundreds of millions of credit cards. We do billing for a lot of things. We have SOCs. We have PCI, just like anybody else who does business today. And we had a third-party agent there. And, and to be totally honest, the, the fault of that agent not really providing us a lot of value had mostly to do with how we used it. It was literally checking, checking a box for us and not really uh, actionable, actionably reducing risk. And then the, the, the idea of deploying that across our entire environment, not just to the things that are under compliance, uh, would have been potentially costly and difficult to scale. So what we wanted to do is let, let's see if we can make OS Query uh, do this for us. And so th these are our goals, and, and I'm going to tell you about how we did it. So the structure of the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you about what we did, how we structured it, some of the constraints, how we satisfied them. And then I'll walk through uh, th a few use cases that, to be totally honest, they're a little bit weird, and they're, they're kind of what I came up with at the time. But please feel free to ask me more questions about the weird and bizarre things that we can answer using OS query data. Uh, it's it's, like, it's kind of like a throwdown now. Like People are like, I wonder how much Ruby we have. And I'm like, hold on, beep, boop, beep, boop. 
We have six applications using Ruby. They're like, six? Really? Only six? We have 7,000 applications. Nobody else is using Ruby? And so, you know, there are things like that that we've been able to do that, you know, are hard to like put a, put a value on, but it helps us when we're doing security assessments to say, like, do we need to do vulnerability management for Ruby? Right? Like, and before we had this data, we literally would basically get the smartest people who had been at Netflix the longest and be like, how much Ruby do you think there is? And so, um, sorry, I digress. And, and literally, like, this is like state of the art um, for, for Netflix and for many environments too, of like, you know, how do you manage all this complexity? So we'll talk about some of the use cases we use it for and then I'll wrap up. Okay, so what does a kind of canonical cloud instance or container monitoring architecture look? So I, I threw this little picture together. We've got some instance, some OS that's running. We're going to stick an agent on it. It's going to produce data that we need to ETL. We're going to throw that into some storage. We need to do some analysis on it, maybe streaming if it's, if it's uh, real, real time needs. We need to do batch analysis to figure out what's going on. We need some user interfaces, and we might need a control system. So when I first drew this, I'm like, boy, that sounds expensive. That sounds like a bunch of services that I cannot run. I'm not allowed to run. I'm not allowed to run uh, real engineering things at Netflix. Uh, they don't give me that uh, pr privilege, and that is a good thing. Do not do that. So what we did is we said, OK, well, let's look at this and s figure out how we can minimize this. And so our architectural approach is really green, right? I am up here telling you how Netflix is saving the world uh, through recycling. We want to reduce, reuse, and recycle. Right? How many existing services can we use to make this tick? Uh, how much can we kind of make trade-offs that minimize the operational overhead and needing to maintain and operate all those things? So these are some of the design principles I had. Absolutely zero new services to maintain. None. So that means no control plane, no new UI, uh, no uh, methods for managing all that batch analysis and stuff like that. Uh, we wanted to uh, deploy this, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, as part of our base operating system image. And then we also wanted to be very careful about how much data we collect and how frequently we do it. So for the most part, we, we never collect any data faster than about once an hour, and in many cases, it's much longer than that. Uh, at the time that we were doing this, which was in 2019, 2020 timeframe, we basically looked at the various features in OS Query for events that were using the audit subsystem, and we we're like, that sounds scary. Anything that can lock up the kernel is gonna get us killed. So no events, only scheduled queries. Uh, we also made the decision based upon reusing existing services to ship the data that we really wanted to try and avoid anything that was sensitive. So for example, we said no command line arcs, no process environment variables because the likelihood that we pick up a password or a credential or other sensitive information uh, from our fleet of thousands of applications is non-zero and we don't wanna mess with that. Uh, and so as a result of having no new services, we had no dynamic query capability. We're gonna bake the configuration in and that's what it's gonna be. Uh, we use uh, extensions a lot. I love extensions. I've heard that a lot throughout this talk. I'm going to say it too. Extensions really make uh, OS Query really powerful. And we're going to have one big sh shared data pipeline that we use for OS Query across all of the different use cases we want to use it for. So without further ado, this is what OS Query looks like at Netflix. So we have our EC2 instances. They run an OS Query uh, process. That goes into a system called Keystone. Uh, later on, feel free, I, sorry, I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the talk. If you go to tinyurl slash netflix osquery you can see a copy of this talk. And in the notes section, there's a bunch of links to like Netflix tech blogs and other things that describe some of these systems. Because I can't be like, well, hey, you use Keystone, because Keystone is a service we built, and you don't have one, and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> but underneath, it's basically like super duper fancy cool Kafka, and it was already an existing service, so we were able to wire it up pretty easily. And uh, what we do is we sync our data, for a small amount of it, into an Elasticsearch, an Elk stack, basically. We also throw data into our big data warehouse where it gets stored in Hive. And then we have uh, ETLs that run in Spark that take that and kind of enrich it and make it a little bit more useful. And then we basically rely upon the existing set of big data tools that Netflix already has. So again, I feel like I'm kind of cheating here, being like, yeah, we did this with no effort because Netflix has built all of these services that make this easy. But what I am gonna try and tell you is that to the extent that you can reuse existing things, you can totally do that for OS Query. These don't need to be purpose-built for it. Uh, last thing I'll mention is that we have a whole detection system called Snare. Again, there's a tech blog that describes how that thing works. I am not expert in that, but we do actually siphon OS query data out of Keystone into regular Kafka where it gets ingested into that detection system, uh, where things like uh, CloudWatch and other data are going in where we can do detections on. All right. So uh, that's how the kind of basic architecture works. Uh, we also wanted to be able to do this in containers just as well as we could do this in VMs. So we built out a system for doing this in our container platform. 
So we have a container platform called Titus. It's kind of weird. I won't go into all of the details, but just imagine that um, you were trying to sort of do Kubernetes with Mesos and Docker about five years ago, and then you wanted that to look as close to EC2 as you possibly could. So we have very big, thick containers. They have their own network interfaces. They have security groups attached to them. They are very much like VMs, but we have a container platform that can orchestrate and operate them. But the thing you need to know is that each of those runs on top of a real host, an actual EC2 instance, which are like the container hosts. These are like the kubelets in, in Kubernetes land. And so what we do is we use one OS query process that runs on the host machine, and we basically use it to peer into all of the containers. And the nice thing about this is that uh, we don't actually have to have anything inside of the container in order to monitor it, because we use basically namespace trickery in the Linux kernel to allow us to do this. So OS query uh, natively has some support for this. If you ever see a table that has this very weirdly named, and, and I, I don't fault anyone who named this, because I, don't, I can't come up with a better one, but PID with namespace, if you see that as one of the columns in, an OS, in, in a table in the schema, what that actually means is that you can hand it a process ID, which is associated with the container namespace, and OS query will jump into that mount namespace, do whatever it is that table was going to do. It's actually a parameter. It's not something that you get back. So uh, there's a bunch of tables that already had that feature. We leveraged those. Uh, those only work for the file system, for things that OS query is looking for on disk. If you need to do things in other namespaces, uh, then we had to do that by hand, basically. So we wrote a custom Golang extension with basically a various NSenter style trickery to get into our containers. And the end result of this is really cool, which means that every single piece of data that we collect from EC2, we have exactly the same information collected for every container workload at Netflix. And furthermore, since we've deployed the agent on the host machines, where we have full control over the lifecycle and the installation of those, uh, you get this no matter what. If you use this container platform, we're going to monitor you. All right, so how do we actually get it into those EC2 instances? Uh, we bake and build a base OS image that pretty much is pretty universally adopted. You know, 98 plus percent of all of the EC2 instances use it. And we basically start with the OS query upstream OSS package. We have our own little Debian package that in installs our, our canonical set of query packs. It configures OS query, and it you know, kind of does some trickery with systemd to, to keep OS query from uh, going too nuts. So we have uh, belt and suspenders here. Uh, I'll, I'll mention later, we, we do configure the watchdog in OS query, but we also keep, configure systemd to keep an eye on OS query, because we really, like I said, do not want it going nuts all of a sudden and having application that owners notice, or God forbid, actually causing a change to the application's behavior. Uh, as I mentioned, we love extensions. We have a Golang-based extension. It has a custom logger that wires itself up to our Keystone pipelines that move the data through the, the world, and we also have a handful of custom tables uh, that we've implemented, mostly for container monitoring, but a few that are just sort of Netflix-specific. And then, uh, obviously, in order to do this on the container system, we have a special set of query packs that query and, and monitor the containers, and then we have custom watchdog configuration for our Titus uh, compute agents, because those are really big machines. They're like M5, R5 metals. You know, they're like gigantic computers. And so we, we want to, we, we basically chill the watchdog out a little bit on those because they are so gigantic. All right, let's talk about queries. So we started with uh, the queries that Palantir uh, and Chris Long, who might have been here, uh, put out you know, back in like 2017, 2018. We're like, yeah, this seems reasonable. So we started with that and we customized it a little bit. Like I said, most of our queries are hourly at most. Uh, and, and they're differential, and then we have kind of 12 or even weekly snapshots of data. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to collect information on things that, that get deployed and disappear rapidly, as well as things that persist forever. And so the, the beauty of the differential and snapshot capabilities within OS Query allow us to kind of do both of those things at the same time. So we collect a bunch of information here. I won't go through all of it. A lot of this is based on that Palantir config, um, but we kind of collect information about networking, processes, software, and, oh, I, did, I made a cut and paste error, and users, not software twice. All right, so now let me amaze you with, with amazing numbers. So uh, I looked the other day, or uh, actually it was a couple weeks ago, about 98% of our ECU2 instances are reporting and have OS query on them, and as I mentioned, because of the way we've deployed monitoring for our container platform, it is 100% covered. Uh, we have, like I said, seven million workloads, two and a half million, um, or seven million microservices, and two and a half million kind of instantiations thereof. And we're pulling about uh, three quarters to a billion rows of data out of OS Query every day. Um, I, I, just some fun stats, there's 9,000 different Debian packages that we have installed across our fleet. Uh, there are 250 million process listing, or, or processes that in all the process listings. Uh, here's a fun one, 
of all the 65,000 ports that you can bind to, uh, we are binding to 51,000 of them on, on some application. <laughs> you know, some application is binding to each of those. So what this tells you is that, that like, just a wide variety of things going on in our environment. And this is why it's really valuable to have OS Query, because these are things that we did not know. Like, who the hell is binding to port 34,322? But somebody is, right? And, and, and from a security perspective, I can say, well, maybe, maybe I want to know why. And then lastly, and this one's really important, is that you know, all of this stored in S3 doesn't cost that much. It's, like, it's less than $1,000 to, to hold on to this data uh, every year. So uh, you know, again, we're reusing. We're reusing our big data architecture. It has fancy ways of storing the data in S3 and in, in, uh, in Hive and, and in Iceberg and Parquet. There's various formats for how that gets done. But you know, this doesn't have to be, to be uh, gigantic, and it doesn't have to be scary. So here's a few of the lessons. You know, we reused a bunch of services, and that was a good play. Uh, we absolutely are able to operate this with almost no kind of overhead. We love the Golang OS query extensions. They're just so damn easy. And uh, I want to thank anyone who had any involvement in, in creating the sort of framework for, for getting that going. Uh, we also you know, found some bugs or wanted to introduce some features in the upstream OSS project. And they will take your PRs. But uh, prepare yourself to C++. Uh, sometimes people would see me and I would be all grumpy. Usually I'm a kind of happy person. And then I just have this scowl on my face. I'm like, Tapio, what's wrong? I'm like, I had to write C++ today. <laughs> I'm not happy. I'm not happy. And as a security practitioner, this is my, my time, my platform to tell you, please, for the love of God, if you're writing anything to do with security, do not do it in a, uh, a type unsafe and memory unsafe language. However, that's exactly what I just did. So. Take that with a grain of salt. The, the raw data that comes out of our environment, uh, it gets sort of flattened by OS Query. We use, I didn't mention this, the logger snapshot uh, event type equals true, which basically means that every uh, piece of data that comes out of OS Query looks like it's a snapshot of, of, uh, in time. And parsing that is kind of tricky. We also have multiple AWS accounts, multiple regions, multiple environments. And querying that big pile of raw data was a real pain in the butt. So, we developed some very simple Spark ETLs that help to sort of shove the data back into useful tables that are much easier to consume on the, on the other side. Uh, we really missed, or I personally very much missed, process command line arguments. There's a lot of useful information in there. I really, really kind of wish I had it. And uh, the good news is about a month or so ago, uh, we finally just uh, added this feature back in. Uh, and the reason for that is that the various services that we rely on, like Keystone and our big data warehouse, now have the ability to store data securely, and we can do access control on those. So we're less worried about collecting sensitive information because we can do access control on it. All right, it takes a long time to permeate our fleet with updates, right? There's a long tail to this. The vast majority of applications update quickly, but as I said, when you multiply this out over hundreds of thousands and millions of workloads, the amount of time that it takes to get to everybody takes a really long time. And as a result, you know, introducing new data that we want to collect has to go into that static config, and then that static config gets to permeate through our environment, literally over potentially years. And, and that's not fast enough for many of the things we want to do, it, do with it. And I mentioned before that like, I don't like collecting big piles of data, uh, but I, I just collected a big pile of data. We don't actually use all of this information yet, um, but it has been useful. So let's talk about how it's been useful. All right, uh, I had a whole joke about this, but I'm gonna like reframe it, uh, which is that this is your opportunity to uh, prepare yourself for Log4j. I feel like everybody else who talked about it did not have this, because personally, I actually feel a twinge of stress <laughs> and like, like tiredness and confusion like flow over me whenever I think about this. And so I, I just wanna prepare you all. We're gonna talk about that very briefly. We're gonna talk about Log4j. Uh, it's a big deal for me because uh, I do a lot of things at Netflix. My job is both weird and extremely exciting, uh, namely that I work with these infrastructure partners, but I also have an on-call rotation and our team is responsible for vulnerability incidents. So flashback, it's December 9th, 2021. Uh, we were having a hack day, I was having a great day, it was super awesome. I was also on call, I was trying to pay attention, you know, do some things. Kind of mid-afternoon, I start like flipping through Twitter. And I'm like, this is part of my job, because uh, again, state-of-the-art vulnerability discovery, flip through Twitter, right? I mean, I, I, I think there are people actually productizing this, but like, it's amazing how many of the most serious security vulnerability incidents that we have discovered have come from flipping through Twitter. So I see this and I'm like, oh crap. And that's when the incident began. So. What did we do? So as I mentioned, you know, we don't have the ability to reconfigure what we do with OS Query. So we have to 
use, we had what we had, right? And what we had was something sort of useful. So we had a whole process that we developed literally like overnight uh, to discover our vulnerable universe. And that was done by things like scanners, uh, a detection engine. We also have a big and complicated Java dependency analysis system that actually we built as a result of the Apache struts thing a few years back. It was really great that we had that thing. But we augmented it with OS Query. And what OS Query was able to tell us was not things about Java packages, because we did not have that cool extension that Uma talked about yesterday. Uh, but what we did have is the ability to look at Debian packages. So we had hot fixed our JRE packages to put the property fix. Remember the property fix? Wasn't that just a beautiful thing? And then it turned out to be insufficient. Sorry. I, you, see, you, see the, you see the pain in me from, from OS Query? Or not from OS Query, sorry. Apologies. From, from Log4j. Um, and so we were able to kind of rapidly discover who had deployed that hotfix, but then, of course, you know, by Monday or Tuesday, I forget when it actually was, uh, you know, that, that ceased to be uh, sufficient, and so that went away. Uh, the really enduring thing that we used OS Query for and actually uh, allowed us to find things that we would not have found in any of these other methods was uh, to discover non-standard Java runtime environments. The vast majority of Java applications that run at Netflix, of which there are thousands, we are a big Java house, uh, run in you know, our base operating system with our standard set of JRE tools and frameworks and so on. But there was a bunch of just random weird things like sumo logic and you know, things that just had their own bundled JRE. And we used OS Query to find those and then we would page those app owners and be like, what is this? And um, on at least a handful of occasions we found, oh, forgot about that thing. We need to patch that too. It's a vendor product and so on and so forth. And we actually found instantiations of that in some of our most critical services. So definitely provided value, even though you know, we didn't have the ability to reconfigure it to really help, uh, it still provided us a better view of the overall universe. And the end result, I, I, I could give an entire talk about this, and I know I'm droning on and on. We were able to do, uh, you know, basically remediate all of our thousands of applications, tens of thousands of, of clusters and ASGs, uh, twice in less than se seven days. And uh, OS Query was a big part uh, of helping us to do that. I will say that that was not a pleasant seven days for anyone in Netflix engineering. And uh, you know, we, we thank them deeply for this. And, and I think it was really great and successful. All right, let's go to less stressful, uh, less stressful topics. I gotta compose myself, actually. TLS, this is near and dear to my heart. We have a lot of TLS certificates. Uh, we use them for internal application identities, which we use for mutual TLS. Uh, we have publicly trusted certs that we use both for on our edge as well as internally for internal tools. Uh, we also have certs that we use to talk to partners and uh, that partners use to talk to us. Uh, the big problem, and we, we also have a big uh, system that manages and issues, there are several big systems that manage and issue these certs. And one of the things that we didn't know is where are all these certs? Because in some cases, you can literally go to a web UI and be like, I'd like a cert, put some information on about it, and it'll be like, here you go, here it is. And then those people take those certs and they go God knows where with them. And so what we wanted to know is where do they go? And so what we did is we did this from OS Query. And a very simple, you know, find the listening ports and curl them for TLS certificates and send that back through our data pipeline. And uh, this was you know, very simple, very easy to add, and we were able to discover approximately 700,000 different certs uh, every day uh, as a result of this, pro pro uh, this uh, progress. And uh, we are able to see where we're using MTLS, uh, how much of that has been adopted. We also use this to notify people when their public-facing certs are about to expire and it's gonna you know, cause problems, because again, we can't notify them if we don't know where they put them. All right, last one I'll mention, uh, which is sort of related to some of the vulnerability management work that we've had is that most of Netflix's notion of what's installed where is built from uh, kind of pre-deployment inf information. We bake AMIs, uh, we build container images, and we scan those for vulnerabilities. But like I said, you know, immutable infrastructure is a nice dream, but it isn't always true. And so what we wanted to know is like at runtime, what is actually installed? What is the current state of the system? So we use OS Query to list out all the Debian packages, all the Python, all the NPM, and a handful of other things. And uh, this has been really valuable because it allows us to, like I said, the state of the art was, how much do you think the difference between what we scan before pre-deployment is versus after deployment? And people would say, you know, I think it's wildly different. Other people are like, no, it's totally fine to look at a pre-deployment. And we really had no data to verify that. Now we do. And the answer is nuanced, so it's not really uh, terribly interesting to go into. Uh, but what we've done so far has been able to, like I said, answer that question. That helps us to drive new efforts. And we've also used this just because we happen to have it. The PCI audit came around and we're like, hey, we need kind of proof of how we're doing patch management. And we're like, hey, we got this like history of, of packages installed at runtime collected from this trusted source. And so we're able to use that as part of the evidence to pass our PCI audit. 
All right, let me wrap up because I'm taking forever. The way we've deployed OS Query, it really helps to satisfy the needs that we have uh, surrounding actionability of the data, the performance, the scale, and the attack surface. We were able to sort of balance all those things. Now, granted, some of these trade-offs have been kind of painful, and we talked about that. But uh, the good news, and, and this was my goal all along, is that OS Query is really mostly hands-off. It just sort of works. Uh, we use, reuse those existing services. Uh, we use the Golang extensions to enable our custom logging, as well as a handful of tables, and that's just like devastatingly easy. And uh, that's really great, and I don't have to see plus plus, which makes me a happier human being. Um, definitely only collect the data that you need, even though, like I said, I, I haven't fully done that. And you can get pretty far with a kind of reasonable static set of data that you're collecting. So in the future, this whole notion of being able to dynamically query something within our fleet really pains me, and I want to figure out how to do that on the cheap, uh, either by kind of breaking down and, and actually standing up a control plane service, uh, like fleet or uptics or something, uh, or just doing something crazy like parking something in S3 and having all of our hundreds of thousands of instances uh, go and pull that and pull it down every five minutes or so. Another thing I mentioned early on was that we avoided the, the audit D-based events, uh, but now that you know, eBPF has come along to OS Query, and obviously we, we love eBPF, uh, Brendan Gregg, though, recently uh, departed for Intel, uh, was a big, big uh, proponent of this within Netflix. We love EPPF, and we would love to be able to use it within OS Query. So we want to take another look at that now that that's made its way into the open source project. So I will wrap up by saying like, that you can do this at a pretty dramatically large scale, and it's not that bad. Uh, you can totally do this in your spare time if you so chose, which is what I did. And uh, it can be pretty helpful, even in the face of you know, heart-wrenching security incidents like the Log4j. So with that, I will wrap up. And I would like to thank various folks, some of which are here, some of which are not, uh, who helped to contribute to this. Gabriel, uh, my colleague here from the base operating system team, really started all of this and has worked with me all along to make it work and, uh, and many others. So with that, I would be happy to take your questions. Are you familiar with windmill? I am not, other than as a method to, grain, to grind corn. <laughs> That's the one I'm talking about. Okay. So uh, Heroku, back in the day, made their own control plane for serving up dynamic configs. Mm -hmm. And that was a very simple app that just lived on the internet. And that's exactly what they did for getting their updated query packs. So I don't know if that package is allowed, or if it lives anymore, but that was the old, like, quick and dirty method for serving up those configs. Windmill? OK. I'm, I'm, it was called Windmill. It okay. was a Heroku deployable app thing and everything. Yeah. Nice. OK, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, I, will, I will consider it, yeah. No comment, just the, or no question, just a comment. Thank you. I feel like I should have jokes at the ready for the awkward pause between uh, questions. But, yeah. I was just wondering from, uh, you guys have acquired uh, a, at least a company in the last 60 days from an expanding your OS query deployment into your M&A environments. Is that part of your jurisdiction and how does that work? Uh, great question. Uh, I will say that, you know, historically Netflix has not been a mergers and acquisitions type of company, but then like maybe about 18 months ago, we like got on a, on a little bit of a, of a buying spree. Um, to date, we have kept most of our M&A things sort of at arm's length. Uh, in, in some cases, we've brought them into our AWS organization so that we have a little bit more control over them. But for the most part, they are completely separate, and we haven't got there yet. Um, but I don't think that's going to be able to be true for future M&As, and it may not even be true for ones that we've already done. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that not yet. Uh, I have two questions. The first is you made reference to uh, making use of schedule max drift. Uh, and I'm wondering how much of a clock smear you're doing across all of your instances so that you're not tanking performance. Uh, so I think we just set that to be relatively big. Because again, we're not collecting anything faster than an hour. So we really don't care. Uh, and so mostly what we were finding, though, is that especially as I got a little nuts with the Golang extensions, uh, we did have some queries, especially like on those container hosts, that take a long time. And they use a non-trivial amount of resources. Uh, and, and every once in a while, we were discovering that the watchdog was, was, was murdering OS query, and we didn't want it to. And, and again, the timeliness was not important for us, so we just, like, we just amped up schedule max drift like big time, basically. What are you using for checking the performance of your queries, if any, anything other than uh, hopes and looks like the watchdog killed it, better rewrite it? 
Uh, yeah, I would say that um, the primary method that we use is that Gabriel and I think really hard. And then we're like, seems cool. And the watchdog and system D will save us if anything bad goes wrong. So, so yeah, we're, we're erring on the side of like, uh, we are OK to lose visibility rather than affect performance. Uh, and, and again, that's, that's partly, you know, is that the right approach as a security professional? I would, I would feel squeezy about that. But from the operational constraints that we have, it's a totally reasonable thing for us to do. Uh, and furthermore, you know, if, if we happen to get killed in one instance, uh, in a cluster that has 6,000, it's kind of OK. Right? We got 5,999 other ones that should be identical that we can collect data from. Uh, and so uh, for the most part, we just kind of like, we just chill out about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some data is better than uh, somebody else coming down and saying you can't use it anymore. Yeah, yeah. And, and so far, at least, uh, even some of our most uh, persnickety and uh, opinionated application owners, uh, cough, cough, the people who run our uh, telemetry system, we love you if you're out there, if you're going to see this at some point. Uh, even they have been, because they, they, they definitely disable things that get in their way. And, and, and they also like look at their logs and have been able to tell us when OS Query was having a problem that we weren't looking at. Uh, but so far, uh, I don't know, or maybe, do you know, Gabriel, if anybody has actually turned it off because they were mad at it? I think the answer is no. And that's been a, a win for us, basically. So uh, yeah, I think that was in the slide, but it, it, we, 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 we run uh, monthly OS updates unless there's something important to do, like uh, you know, a JRE vulnerability or a really nasty Apache thing, we'll do a hot fix of it. But usually those OS updates come out on a monthly cadence. And then there's still, like I said, to really get the long tail of applications at Netflix, it can take some number of months uh, to really permeate a large fraction of our environment. Usually, it's relatively quick for a lot of applications because, like I said, people are deploying regularly. But that long tail definitely kills us. Uh, no, basically, at that point, we were like, like I said, we, we had what we had. Whatever OS query was already collecting is all we had to work with. And, and like I said, that was a, a limitation of how we chose to deploy it, which you know, kind of hurt, right? I was like. I wish <laughs> that I could do this, you know. Uh, I, when I saw the uptics work on like, you know, unpacking jars, I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, in a Golang extension, that's like 20 lines of code, that's not hard, right? I could totally do that, but we cannot get it out in our environment. We can't uh, push that change out. And what we were trying to do with the, the whole log4j thing is encourage these thousands of app owners to affect change in their application. So rather than saying affect change to help us monitor, we're like, just patch it and do that instead. So, so that, that ended up being the approach during that incident. And, and, and to be honest, any, that have happened uh, before and since, uh, because we don't yet have this like dynamic capability. After seeing log 4 j and you decided to handle the patch and the log capability, did it keep happening every few months or change your strategy? Uh, in a word, no. Uh, but like I said, I think what I really want is to get even a very dumb and basic dynamic capability, because there's a there's a, there's a decent way that we could go just by actuating OS query as it exists today differently. Uh, that I would love to have that first and then look at, at like sort of extensions and add-ons. Uh, we have made other investments to deal with Java vulnerabilities, uh, like to do with our, our dependency scanner, how we do vulnerability management overall. Lots of changes resulted to this, but so far at least, the main thing that came out of, of, of this for OS Query is that Netflix kind of realized, hey, this is super useful. This is actually helpful. It's not just this crazy thing that Nabil and Gabriel do on the, in their spare time. Uh, and so that was good for us. So there's more attention on it, more, more desire to, to own it as like a real thing. In your architecture diagram, you show logging to both an Elastic instance and to Hive, I think it was. You're, or you're probably querying from S3 with Hive, I imagine. How do you find the balance of using both of those? Do you take advantage of both the more hot storage in Elastic and colder storage in Hive, or and what's the balance like for that? That's a very good question. I think, to be, to be totally honest, the reason that it's architected that way is that that's very commonly how people wire data up in Keystone, our, 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 our streaming data system. Like These are like the two most common things that people do with it, so we did it too. Um, in the beginning, I'll say that I use the Elastic instance more because I was more familiar with it. Um, but like I said, it's actually kind of tricky. Right? We have uh, kind of a test environment and a prod environment. 
and then underneath that there are regional specific elastic clusters and sort of doing fleet-wide queries, which is really what we care about. Rarely are, am I looking at OS query data and be like, I only want prod, I want everything. And so that's just much easier to do uh, now in Hive. So uh, we, we still have those elastic clusters. I actually kind of wonder if we should keep them around because they're, they're kind of expensive. Uh, there's just a bunch of EC2 instances that host all of that and it costs a lot of money. Uh, I kind of keep it there because it is very, it's just very accessible to explore the data. You can just go in there and throw a keyword in and just see if you can find things. Um, but uh, me personally, I have sort of gotten more familiar with our big data tooling, much more powerful, much more capable. And for the most part, systems that consume the OS query data uh, do so via either those real-time streaming things or via the big data tables. And so for the most part, like people aren't sitting at like an OS query pane of glass, right? They're just looking at how that information has traversed to other systems. Like we have an inventory system that holds information and security vulnerabilities and other data about every application at Netflix. OS query feeds metadata into that and it just shows up in that inventory system. So I would say uh, for the most part, I think it's more on the Hive and big data side, but we keep the elastic thing around for, for quick queries and for exploration. It's just easier to interact with. Like you can send anybody there and they can just look at what, what, what's available. Would you, uh, I guess two questions, um, would, you, would you still be comfortable only running once per hour queries without like cloud backends like CloudWatch or whatnot or is the once per hour thing kind of the way that you would go either way? Are you saying like, like do we do that so because we have other sources of information? Right. Um, I think that, the, like I said, the reason that we chose to do that didn't actually have to do with how much data we wanted. It had to do with us being very conservative about performance and overhead impacts on the application. Uh, and furthermore, like I said, that most of the actionable use cases that we wanted to use for this data, many, much of them are very broad. Like for example, we collect the TLS certificates and I aggregate those all up uh, over the course of a day or even a week, right? It's, it's, it's not, the, the granularity of time is not super important. Sure. Um, you know, I, I can't think of situations where we want data faster uh, than an hour in most cases, and so it, it, we don't yet have strong need for that yet, given the use cases that we're using it for. And again, considering that uh, forensics and, and incident response with where we, we actually don't know what we need yet are, are low on our priority list to solve. And, and as you saw with the Log4j thing, you know, there's more that we could have done, but we couldn't because of how we were configured. Okay. And uh, just to clarify, you, you, you said you collect uh, five million lines a day and the S3 buckets for that cost about $1,000 a year? So we, I said we, we have about a billion events, a billion, I don't know what they call them in OS query land, you know, a billion rows of, of, of data come back. And yeah, the, when it actually lands in S3, it, it doesn't cost very much. Uh, again, there's, there's some magic there in terms of our big data architecture, how it compresses and encodes and puts that in S3. Uh, but it's not actually all that much data. It's basically a handful of terabytes. And so, uh, you know, the other day it was default set to like live for 10 months. I'm like, oh, well it costs, you know, this amount of insignificant dollars. I should just up the, up the retention time for this because throwing it away is, is almost meaningless. But like I said, like the, the cost of our elastic clusters is like, you know, or several orders of magnitude more than our S3 costs. So we should go nuts with S3 basically. You know, as a, as a conference about an agent, I have to say it's, reaffir it's reaffirming to say we're using an agent almost for free with no impact to production. When what I keep hearing out in the press is like, no, you gotta use an agentless solution. Did you look at agentless solutions of snapshotting, you know, one million volumes, copying them somewhere else and running these queries? And why was that a bad idea? Uh, so uh, full transparency, we are looking at uh, agentless kind of approaches, especially for vulnerability management. But one of the nice things about OS Query is that you know, we do have the headroom to run another process, use a little bit of RAM, occasionally use a little bit of CPU. Like that, that's cool, as long as we don't go nuts. Uh, and uh, we also really like a bunch of the runtime information that we get. Like I said, the listening ports, the process listings, the, the, the args that we now have, uh, as well as like the, the, the network in, networking and other kind of data. So really, you know, if you go back to those pillars of stuff we get, we only get about half of those if we do like kind of uh, side scanning or, or, or volume-based scanning. On the uh, TLS check, was that just file system level or was that actually bound to an interface or an application? So uh, the, uh, that's an off-the-shelf uh, OS query table and it actually uh, fires up and uh, connects up to the ports you tell it to 
does the handshake and harvests the cert. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll toot my own here, horn here. I tried that for the first time to just say, hey, there's a TLS certificates table. Let me wire it to listing ports and see if it worked. It hung forever. Uh, and that's because the TLS certificates table implementation inside of OS Query had no timeout. And so if you had Netcat listening on some port and just said nothing, uh, OS Query, the, the demo would hang forever. Uh, so we, we, rewrote, we rewrote, rewrote that and upstreamed it and they took it. Thank you. And so now you can safely run that, that query. There's a timeout parameter now. Uh, and yeah, so doing that in containers was actually kind of a challenge uh, because of the way our containers are structured. We, we love namespaces more so even than anybody like Kubernetes and so on. And so uh, each individual uh, container in our environment has its own user namespace. It has its own uh, network namespace, its own mount namespace, and so on. So we actually have to have OS Query jump inside of the network namespace to make those, those, those curls. Um, so far, at least, nobody has complained that like, you know, some random thing is, 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 is connecting and doing a handshake. People have not noticed yet. This happens very infrequently. Uh, but yeah, it is live, real kind of data. And uh, it has the kind of ground truthiness to it that uh, we really like, uh, as opposed to just like scanning, looking for the certs on disk. I had a question, and um, this was sort of out of scope of your presentation, but this concept of user-driven security came up in uh, Andrew Mises' talk yesterday. I know uh, Netflix released Stethoscope a number of years ago and published um, some public use cases around that. Are you guys still doing that today? Is OS Query part of that still? Um, uh, in a word, yes, uh, though I will say I am at the edge of my confidence. Uh, so we, you know, this is all about how we run our AWS cloud. Uh, we, we still have Stethoscope. We've evolved it from, you know, like an agent that runs on the system to a Chrome extension. Uh, and then we also have started to pair that, a, that Chrome extension with, uh, you know, a, a management set of things like a standard EDR tool. Uh, we deploy optics on, our, 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 on some of our endpoints. Uh, but we have a lot of challenges. Like I said, there's you know several there's there's 10,000 plus employees. There's a large set of contractors, and then we have a huge set, hundreds of thousands of different partners who use Netflix services. And there's a lot of, of, of BYOD. Uh, and so what we're trying to figure out in the in the user facing endpoint side is how to how to balance sort of our security needs and our desires to do things like zero trust, like was talked about in the previous talk, with you know how invasive uh, do we want to be with the the endpoints and hosts that uh, this large uh, and varied population of users has. So right now we're really focusing on employees because we can definitely like tell you what to do on your employee device, uh, even though some of those are also BYOD. Does that, does that help? Definitely, thank you. Awesome, well, let's give a round of applause for Nabil here, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to go on a break, folks, so um, please enjoy our refreshments, more coffee, and a little bit of sunshine as well. Thank you very much.